Yes, welcome to the Jamaica Young Police channel. To our loyal viewers and subscribers at the channel, we are a group of law abiding citizens who believe in the rule of law and respect the rights of every citizen, but not the ones who do not subscribe to such behavior. We do believe in and support preemptive strikes because it saves lives. Yes, we are all about saving lives here at the Jamaica Young Police Channel. And the reason why we support preemptive strike because yeah, it is a policy that saves lives because we are all about saving lives over here at the Jamaica Young Police Channel. Yes, you know, life is precious. You only get one life. So that's the reason why we are all about saving lives here at the Jamaica Young Police Channel. You know, so that is one of our philosophy and motto over here, you know, you understand. But before we begin this video today, we want the criminal supporters, enablers, sympathizers, financiers and beneficiaries to know that we do not want them over here. Yeah, please go elsewhere, man. We do not want your views, comments or support because we aid criminals with a passion and we do not negotiate with terrorists or want them in our midst. Please go elsewhere. You are not welcome. So you must understand if somebody is telling you that they do not want you in their midst, why are you coming? The honest person we know do such thing, you know. It's people like being a man, you're shame being a man, and him still I come around here and him think that we don't want you guys over here. Yeah, period. We don't care about you from your criminal supporter, anything to do with criminals, don't come over here. We don't want you here. Cause we don't negotiate with criminals. We're a group of law abiding citizens. And we do believe that criminals must live in fear of losing their lives and not the law abiding citizens. That's our motto over here. So don't come over here and we don't want to hear what about and this and that. We don't into that madness. Alright, so today. Yes, today, you know, we're advising our audience member that we are coming up close to the anniversary when Christopher Dudu spoke from Tivoli Gardens, Kingston decided to raise a militia to take on the state of Jamaica and its security forces and cause the economy to come to a sudden grinding halt because this man thought in his big head that he could take on the United States of America and win. From extraditing him in to their shores to face charges of drug dealing and importation of firearms from their shores to Jamaica due to the man's ego which is larger than the Jamaican National Stadium and the full fool advisors and low IQ men who encouraged him to take on the state of Jamaica he did not comply with the extradition order and freely went to the United States of America all he had to do was leave the island freely and face the music for his crime knowing that he was an international criminal and a man who should have been smarter than the average low, low IQ criminals. Dudus, Christopher Dudus quote, problem started when he and other kingpin drug dealers in Montego Bay, St. James, decided to use money from drug dealings to hoist Edward Sierra from the leadership role of the Jamaica Labour Party. It installed a puppet. Yes, Christopher Dudus quote was able to install a puppet named Bruce Golden, who was not a labor right but an opportunist who wanted power by any means necessary. The man was in the second in line in the 1990s to become Prime Minister and he would have been Prime Minister long before 2007. But because of the same people, the Issas and all those people in St. James that told him that he was more popular than Edward Siaga, he had formed his own third party, the National Democratic Movement, in which it didn't gain any traction. Jamaican people are inherently a two party system, JLP and PMP, in which both political parties now had merged into the LGBTQ plus arena now. Yes, and you can see the advertisement that in Jamaica. We are not digressing, we're just giving you facts. So, you know, we continue the journey. 
So as you know that Bruce Gordon was not labor right, he was just an opportunist who wanted power by any, by any means necessary. Every single person who was involved in the scheme of getting rid of Edward Siaga, all of them paid a price, whether it is political or legal, with some of them in the United States of America, prison for the rest of their lives as they garner their wealth through nefarious means and illicit activities. In the end, Christopher Dulles lost it all, even the protection that his community used to enjoy by not having the security force walking through Tivoli Gardens, Kingston comfortably without any bullets trading between gunmen and the security forces. The autonomy Tivoli Gardens enjoyed for decades is out the window as the PMP LGBTQ plus government installed a police force in Tivoli Gardens. You are going to hear what happened before the first bullet was fired at the soldiers and entering Tivoli Gardens and the persons who have helped Christopher do the scope to evade and elude the security forces with the help of famous police officers, politicians and civilians alike who have given him comfort, support and financing him during his time as a fugitive from justice. You are going to hear names who were involved in this operation to protect this man. You are going to be shocked to know some of your favorite Jamaicans who were involved. And that's one of the reasons why they scrapped the special branch division of the police force. Because this branch was so effective in collecting their intelligence and decimating it through the various agency and the government at the time were none of it because when they saw the intelligence after you know Owen Ellington as a fan of law enforcement officers but you know he's more intertwined with the criminal underworld and they got rid of the dismount the special branch and agency that was created by the British and left us as Jamaicans to money you know to control our affairs when it comes down to law enforcement. But you know our boss is slave that they are not interested in that they are all about money by any means necessary. They would even sell Jesus Christ for anything because they have no moral standards. So we'll continue the journey. So moving on. Mere acceptance to be led by a liar is to ask to be told lies and the liar must tell a second lie and the first lie. Liars have no conscience and you can see their faces but not their hearts and their supporters are the same. Sociopathic liars, pathological liars, compulsive liars, occasional liars, careless liars, narcissistic liars, habitual liars, pathetic liars, and white liars. One thing they have in common is that they lack truthfulness, honesty, decency, decency and ethics. Some types can be due to an underlying condition, whereas some are just pure liars. Always lying. You can't always change the behavior of a liar, but you can change how you feel and react to them. Liars are people with serious mental condition where a person feels an uncomfortable urge to lie about everything. Experts classify liars as an impulsive control disorder. It is, it's often untreated, treatable with medications, therapy or both. People with this condition might try and successfully not to act on the notion and many can't feel remorse or guilt for lying because it is genetics next to breathing. There are no known cure for lying but to expose and shame liars to diminish them in the eyes of decent, honest and law-abiding citizens. A mental health professional might be required to deal effectively with deep-seated issues and underlying mental disorders. As a loved one, you may also benefit from psychotherapy or a specialized family program. 
the rise and fall of Jamaican leader of the shower posse, Christopher Dudescook, the strong one, the Don, and president of the mother of all garrison, and our fall is because of his allegiances with other drug dealers in western Jamaica who did everything in their financial interest to hoist the late Edward Siago from the JP party and install a puppet Bruce Golden to the hem of the JLP party. He brought his made people from the National Democratic Movement Party and captured the party to become a criminal cuddling and sanctuary for drug dealers and the like. The late Edward Siago did not forgive Christopher Dudescope for what he did so skillfully by ousting the man from the party that had built, that he had built. For that, everyone who was involved in his oyster are either in prison or their political career is over, done and in the dumpster. Siago is not a, was not a forgiving man. Before we begin today's video, we at the Jamaica Young Police Channel want our audience and detractors to know that anything that we have said here that is incorrect, you can reach out to us and we will give you the chance to correct the same. Yes, to us the first and foremost thing about us and this channel is our character, credibility and reputation. We have never slandered or defamed anyone's name on this platform. Whatever you are hearing is the truth. If the truth shall kill those who ate the truth, let it kill them. Yes. So if anything that we are saying and you disagree and you have facts and can back it up, you know you can contact the Jamaica Young Police Channel at 954-556-0275 and we will entertain a call and listen to what you have to say. The trouble that led to Tivola Gardens debt began in August 2009 when the United States government requested the extradition of Christopher Dudas Koch. In the US, Koch stood charged in federal court of trafficking in narcotics and firearms. In Jamaica, he was known as the country's most potent Dan, Don, a community leader who also runs a criminal enterprise. Koch lived in Tivoli Gardens, where everyone called him president, and since 2001, Jamaican police have been unable to enter the neighborhood without permission. Without his permission. So you see how stupid that this man is. Before, before the Tivoli Gardens operation, the security force had to get permission from him to enter this community. So Tivoli Gardens was like a a country within a country so they have their own protection from the law so the police the security force weren't able to operate as any other community experience the security force operate with the laws of Jamaica he was the law in Tivoli Gardens and the security force could not go inside there without his permission. So that goes to show you how this community had enjoy this blanket immunity from the security force in Jamaica to operate autonomously outside of the laws of Jamaica. Coke was so powerful that Prime Minister Bruce Golden spent months resisting the extradition order from the United States of America. But in early May 2010, under every international political pressure, Golden authorized Koch's arrest. In response, Koch converted Tivoli Gardens and nearby Denham Town into a personal force. Yeah, so you know Christopher Dudas Koch had barricaded you know, himself inside of Tivoli Gardens along with his militia. You know, barricades of rubbles and barbed wire sprung up across significant intersections. Armed sentries, these are not, are not police or soldiers, and these are gunmen, you know, militia. You understand? Them took up posts around Tivoli Gardens perimeters. 
it looked as if Thor Coke was preparing for war with the Jamaican state and that's what he did. So that's why I said that he's supposed to be arrested and charged for treason when he returned. Then you have some police, um, or me, bad man, and me's a PMP, and I'm not a PMP, you understand? I'm just for law and order. Because if you attack the state, you know, you're supposed to, if you took on the state and use force and violence because you want the state to comply with you, you know, you try to overthrow the government, so you're supposed to charge with treason. But we haven't heard anything of the sort to, you know, to deal with this, this existential problem that this man had created. So on Sunday, May 23rd, 2010, the Jamaican police asked every radio, radio and TV station in the capital to broadcast a warning that said in part. So this is what the Jamaican security had said. You know, that, um, this is what they had sent out to the people of Jamaica. You understand? The security forces are appealing to the law-abiding citizens of Tivoli Gardens and Denham Town who wish to leave those communities to do so. The police sent buses to the neighborhood edge to evacuate residents to temporary accommodations. So the government was providing accommodation for these people, you know, as they do the evacuation of these citizens. So, you know, who want to leave, leave, and who want to stay, stay, because, you know, it's going to get rough, because it's going to be life or death, based on what is afoot. So the police had sent buses, you know, to the neighborhood's edge to let these people leave, and the government was going to pay for them to stay in hotels. But only a few boarded the buses, and the buses drove off away nearly empty. Marjorie Hines, who supported her family by selling groceries from a wooden shed, was one of the residents who ignored the warning. She was 37 years old and took pride in her clothes, cooking, manicured nails and iron hair. Hines lived with her boyfriend Radcliffe Mickey Freeman and their two children, 11-year-old Nikita and 8-year-old Mickey Jr. The apartment were on the ground floor of Building 2, just north of Coke's headquarters in the era of Tivoli known as Java. Freeman had been working in the US when in April Hines asked him to return home. Freeman had played on the same street corner football team as Coke when they were children, but their lives followed a very different path. So one, you know, venture into criminality and the other one become a tradesman. And you know, just do the right thing as a decent and law abiding citizen. While you know do this as follow him father, footstep on the family of continuing his criminality. So they went on you know different parts. So from 2007 to 2008, Freeman worked on completing a new M US embassy compound in, in Kingston, Jamaica, a job requiring his name to be checked against lists of known criminals maintained by the Jamaican police. Contractors in Kingston and the United States knew him to be a hard-working carpenter and a family man. That day in May, Heinz thought about leaving Tivoli, but she told herself that everyone who fled would have lived with the shame of abandoning the community. So you see how it stayed up, you know, that, that's not even peer pressure, you know, that's a terrorist pressure you know, by them. So based on the community, so it's either you're with us or against us. So the people of Tivoli have to decide, boy, we have to with do this, you know, kind of criminal. Because if we leave, we're going to come, you know, they will say we abandon the community. And neighbors might label her and her family an informer. She also didn't think that the security forces would enter. Heinz told a, told a friend word about an invasion. So I listen, you know, as so Tivoli people behave in a year or no. Tivoli Garden is the baddest place in the whole wide world. I don't know where she get that from. Because she don't know, so, you know, <laughs> Tivoli girl, this can't be the baddest place on earth. It's where really war going, so they want to bring it down. Because every time you're in an argument 
with the people from Tivoli Gardens. Them all is a boast, oh, you know, Tivoli, a garden may come from them. I said, Tivoli Garden. So once them said that you're supposed to free them, because them have 10 life and you have one, and they will take yours. You know, as if they are, them have superiority, or them have a, them, them superior to other Jamaicans or other people. And them can kill you, and you can't kill them. Because them come from the and them are killers. That's how them operate. You know. On Monday, May 24th, Heinz woke up to sporadic gunfire. Three men was calm, and Heinz, who had not been outside for three days, assumed it was safe to go and buy food. Heinz anxiously dialed his send phone and reached him at the house of a friend named Hugh Scully who lived nearby, Freeman, as was gone. Late in the morning, she left her apartment. It was a clear day, and the trade winds off the harbor ease the sun dizzying heat. Armored personnel carrier and soldiers from the Army, Jamaica Defense Force, and the police, the Jamaica Constabulary Force, were massing to the south and east outside the ring of bar barricades. A white surveillance plane circled Kinson. A blue seal on the tail identified as belonging to the United States Department of Homeland Security. So the American, you know, they were a part of the operation because they were supplying the Jamaican security force in real time intelligence and data of what's happening below. At 11 a.m., gunfire erupted. Yes, everyone in the street around building to scramble for cover. Many ran to the ground floor apartment of an older woman named Marilyn Campbell that's Ein's neighbor when they come to my house they are all family Campbell said later suddenly a JDF helicopter appeared overhead and an explosion struck Ein's she fell in the middle of the street and blood flowed from gush gashes on her leg and face her yellow shorts were charred blacked and her hip and buttocks were severely burned. Wow, so they drop a bomb in that Tivoli. A neighbor ran to Scully's house where Freeman was tending to a young man injured in an explosion nearby. Marjorie dead, he cried. Freeman found Hines lying unconscious where she had fallen. He picked her up and rushed to Campbell's apartment where his daughter was hiding under Campbell's bed. Freeman laid Heinz on the floor with her head resting in his lap. She came momentarily and asked for water and Campbell brought some. The men sat silently in chairs. The woman cracked open the window and peeked out into the street. The gunfire seemed to be getting closer. Four or five hours later, Campbell's door was kicked down and about 10 soldiers burst into the apartment. They carried M16 rifles and wore, a camouf and wore the camouflage uniform of the army. They had yellow police line tape tied around their arms. The soldier carried Heinz to the jeep, to a jeep, taking her to the Kinson Public Hospital. So the reason why the soldier had the yellow police line on their arm is to identify them. So, you know, no friendly fire. And anyone who have military appar um, apparel in Tivoli Gardens at the time, so they were able to dis distinguish them from the real soldiers. Because you know, criminals in Jamaica, you know, they have all kind of uniform. Because you know, we have criminal minded police and soldiers. Yeah, we have a lot of people who are in the security forces in Jamaica, they are criminals, just like the people who are terrorizing the, the people within the communities. And it's just that they're criminals in uniform. You're going to find them all over in Jamaica because in Jamaica, you know, good police officers and good soldiers are shunned. You have to be a criminal. They know say you're a thief and you're a drug dealer and you're a transport drugs and you're a cell gun and you're a cell shot. You know, that's, that's how they operate there. You understand? Yeah. So, you know, we'll continue. We'll continue. You know, moving on. You understand? So, you know, they took her to the Kinson Public Hospital. At around 4 o'clock, the soldiers led the rest of the apartment occupants to a shaded area between the building and the street. 
On a typical day, young men would gather there to sit in high wooden chairs, play dice, and smoke weed. One soldier walked around with a plastic bag collecting cell phones. Campbell's daughter, Ione, remembers the soldier punching and kicking the men and the older boys. Nikita began to cry, what kind of work you do, man? One soldier asked Freeman, whose shirt was stained with Heinz blood. May a carpenter officer reply. Soldier stole Freeman and three other men to stay where they were. Everyone else was ordered to walk a few hundred feet, a few hundred feet to a street called Sangster Crescent. Nikita remember seeing her father sitting peacefully under a tree in the custody of soldiers and a few policemen. She walked with the rest of the group to Sangster Crescent where hundreds of residents sat on the pavement as gunshots continued to echo. But look, all them kind of be very irresponsible by the security forces. Or if you have the people them outside and gunshot a fire, gunshot now have ice in you know. So who was in charge of the separation? You can't treat the people them like that. Not because, you know, not because they're my labor right and, you know, we know them are, um, not all of the people them are typically a parasite. You understand? But you can't, you have, you have good people that live there. So oh, you have the people they must walk and gunshot a fire and all that. That is just crazy. You know, you should I wait until everything is clear and everything before you have the people them out outside. You can't have them out publicly and expose them to danger. That don't make no sense at all. That is just crazy. You understand? You know. So after sundown, Nikita was released. She spent the night at her at a neighbor's apartment. She returned to building two, but one was, was unable to find her father. The following day, she encountered a soldier she recognized from Campbell's apartment. He was stocky, she says, with a dark complexion and a wrinkled face. Hey, your father is a sharp man? He asked in a voice that seemed to full of contempt and satisfaction. Your father did, did you know? Oh, you know, what kind of insensitive person is that? So if they held this man, that a Mickey, them held Mickey and he told him that he was a carpenter. And I don't know, I don't know who to believe here if, yeah, because we know criminals stealing and criminals supporting people. You know, say, uh, Mickey work, uh, work as carpenter and him did have on him, him woman blood, Heinz blood on his shirt and, and him t-shirt and so we don't know what happened. Heinz was in hospital, still unconscious. When she awoke days later, a doctor told her about Freeman. According to a Jamaican doctor familiar with, post, with the post-mortem, he was shot 10 times or more. His burial orders list the time of death as between 23rd and 25th May 2010, and the cause of death was multiple gunshot wounds. Christopher Cook, the Don of Tivoli Gardens and his Dominion was absolute. Nothing else worked there but him. Him or the, him or the president. Anything when he says law. Tivoli Gardens is Tivoli Gardens is ruled with an iron fist by Christopher Dodoscook. And as you know, them say everything is absolute. So no fewer than 97 people were killed in the operation to arrest Christopher Cook and extradite him to the United States of America. So they say, you know, um, three police officers, two soldiers and 95 civilian among the dead were at least three women and one United States citizen. Oh boy. Three more residents of Tivoli Gardens, including a 16-year-old boy, are missing and presumed dead. The Jamaican Security Force says that many dead were gunmen allied with coke, but they removed only six guns during the assault. According to ex extensive interviews with Tivoli residents and Jamaican officials, the resistance that the security forces encountered in Tivoli was quickly overpowered. Coke and most gunmen are believed to have fled when the raid began, escaping through gullies and sewers. The rest of the battle was not a firefight, but a police operation. The security forces rounded up residents and conducted search from house to house 
and our men of fighting age were interrogated on the spot and more than a thousand were sent to detention centers all over the Kingston metropolitan area from which they were released a few days later. Mickey Freeman, one of dozens allegedly shot to, dead in, shot to death in custody. A year and a half later, the Jamaican government has refused to make public what it knows about how the men and women of Tivoli Gardens died. So as the government of the United States, this a clear evidence that the US surveillance plane flying above Kingston on May 24th was taking live video of Tivoli, that intel Tivoli Gardens, that intelligence from the video feed was passed through the US law enforcement officers to Jamaican forces on the ground and that the Department of Homeland Security has a copy of this video. The video could corroborate or refute allegations that members of the Jamaican security force massacred dozens of innocent and could help identify the alleged killers. Yeah, so they're saying that you know the American government have have video, videographic evidence to show that um, the security force committed atrocity against the people. But look, hey, they are the one that chose to take on the security force, you know. And in war, you're going to have casualty. So we have come to the end of part one of this series. We're going to tell you about you know the Tivoli Garden saga leading up to the incursion. And as we have stated before, you're going to hear the names of the people who have helped Christopher Dudescope to escape from the Kinson metropolitan area and on his return to Kinson in the week with Almila how he was caught. Thanks for watching the Jamaica Young Police Channel. Jamaica Young Police Channel out. Oh.